Hey guys, uh, just a quick little video. Um, I have been learning more and more about op amps, uh, and they're actually quite cool little things. If you haven't worked with them before, I suggest reading just a little bit about them. They can seem a little bit intimidating at first. Um, they are kind of complex, um, but also very simple at the same time. Uh, an op amp is, as it suggests, an operational amplifier, so it amplifies, but uh, it has two inputs and one output. Uh, a single, like, plain op amp has two inputs and one output. One of the inputs is represented by a plus sign. It's called the non-inverting input. Another one is represented by a minus sign, which is the inverting input. Now, the output, um, if there's some sort of feedback from the output to the input, the op amp will try to keep the uh, output equal to the input. So it's kind of hard to explain, but the difference between the two um, is what makes the output change. Um, if there's no gain, let's just say you ground one of them and you put a voltage into the other input, that input, uh, it acts as a comparator. It'll, it'll either go all the way to the high voltage rail or all the way to the bottom voltage rail. Um, because the gain or the amplification is so high that even a very small change between the two will essentially saturate the amplifier and force it to go all the way to its highest possible voltage or all the way to the lowest voltage. This is why we use uh, resistors as a feedback from the output to the input. Uh, you can use, there's a few different types of feedback, but that way you can control the gain, how much it actually amplifies your signal. Um, in some cases you can do what's called unity gain, so there is no real gain, it's a gain of one, and it's just used as a buffer. That's actually a very common use for an output. If you have some sort of signal that's a very low impedance, meaning that if you uh, try and sample it or uh, you know test the voltage or try and look at whatever's there, it's so low impedance that you're gonna draw current from it and it'll, um, in, a, in effect, change the signal. So just by looking at it or using it for something, you're going to change the signal and you're not going to get what you want from it. However, you can then use an op amp, you can put that signal into one of the inputs, which in theory doesn't draw any current. Um, they do draw a very, very small amount of current in practice, but it's, uh, I mean, there is somewhere between gig ohms and ter ohms of resistance. Um, and then the output from the op amp is a nice high impedance source. So you can draw current from it and it's not going to affect the signal. So essentially it just acts as a buffer. That's one of the many uses of the op amp. Um, I've actually been reading this excellent article. Um, I have to look up where it's from. It might just be a Wikipedia article. I think it might be. Uh, yeah, it is. It's just called Operational Amplifier Applications. It's a great article. It goes through, um, you know, the most common uh, uses for operational amplifiers. Uh, it has schematics. It explains the math behind everything. Uh, very, very good little uh, article. I'm actually very uh, impressed with it. So, one of the um, circuits I've been trying to build is this one. And it is called, as you can see, a relaxation oscillator. Very, very simple circuit. That is the symbol for the op amp, for those that don't know. As you can see, there's two inputs represented by the plus and minus, and one output. There's, of course, also uh, power going to it, which is sometimes represented by lines coming out of the top and bottom of the op amp, but they don't show them here. In a lot of cases, they're left out for simplicity's sake. So in this case, the output of the op amp is going back through both of these resistors to the respective inverting, uh, inverting and non-inverting inputs, and then, in this case, it's just a resistor divider uh, going to ground, so it's just dividing this voltage in half. The reason you know it's half is because it's assumed, because these are all marked as just R, so all three of those values will be the same. And on the other half, on the inverting input, we have an RC filter, which is going to filter certain frequencies out, or in this case, cause an oscillation. Now, this circuit is so simple, I went to build it up, I've uh, I tried a couple different op amps. The one that seemed to work the best, well, so far, is I just use an LM324, which is just a quad op amp. So that means that there's four of these op amps on one chip. Uh, it, you know, it's it's a very basic part. I'm sure if you watch the EEV blog, you've probably heard Dave talk about LM324s. 
You've also probably heard him talk about op amps, so I might already be repeating a lot of what you already know. Now, in my case, um, oddly, I'm getting this sort of strange oscillation. I mean, obviously the goal here is to get an oscillation, but it's supposed to produce a nice clean square wave. But as you can see in my case, um, it's just giving me this kind of strange spiky looking um, waveform, which isn't exactly uh, helping too much. Well, not, sorry, that didn't make sense. Not that it's not helping too much, but it's not what I want. It's supposed to be this nice uh, square wave, but I'm just getting all these spikes. Now, I'm really not terribly sure why. If we take a close look at one of the spikes here, you can see it almost looks like a slight square wave shape, uh, but then it tapers off very slowly. Um, so I'm really not sure if this is because of the capacitor I've chosen, or if I've done the RC network wrong, uh, the RC filter. Anyway, if anyone knows anything about op amps or anything about the relaxation oscillator in particular, which seems to be, sorry, I'm all zoomed in still, which seems to be a very common, um, very simple circuit that's used in a lot of other circuits, because uh, obviously it's a simple way just to get some sort of oscillation or frequency out with very few components, just an op amp, a few resistors and a cap. Um, uh, I can quickly show you what I have on the breadboard here. I mean, it's not terribly exciting, but uh, there it is. Um, that's where my uh, oscilloscope probe is. As you can see, there's just a few resistors and then the capacitor. This resistor here is actually not needed. Uh, I just put it there so that there's a load on the op amp when I remove the um, oscilloscope probe, otherwise the uh, circuit stops working. So obviously some current needs to be drawn from the op amp. Uh, in a lot of cases, yeah, the output actually needs to be hooked up to something. If you leave the output floating, this whatever you're working on usually won't work. Although of course in most cases you wouldn't leave it open anyway. Um, so as you can see there's an LM324 in there. Let's see if I can get a little bit more light on the situation. So there's an, yeah, LM324 uh, the feedback network, um, I mean, it's such a simple circuit, I don't know what I could possibly be doing wrong, really. But, um, yeah, it's not working properly, it's not giving me a nice clean square wave. So obviously I have a lot to learn, but I'm still trying. So, if anyone has any advice, or if they uh, happen to know what I'm doing wrong, or, you know, anything is very, very much appreciated. I'm gonna keep doing uh, little videos like this. Hopefully I'll make them a little bit more informative, somewhat like Dave's Fundamentals Friday, and try and teach you guys a little bit of something about whatever I happen to be working on at the time. So op amps, um, I'm slowly learning more and more about them. I'm actually starting to understand them very well. I've been breadboarding a lot of little circuits like this. And that's the best way to learn. If you're getting into electronics and you're curious about something you see, just breadboard it. I mean, it takes a few seconds. That's why it's so handy to have breadboards around so you don't need to solder. Um, if I had had to solder this circuit up, it would have taken me, you know, I'm, I'm pretty quick with my soldering iron, but still, you know, you have to break off a little piece of proto board and, you know, get a socket or solder the IC in directly, which kind of sucks, because then if you ever need to take it out again and, it just becomes a bit of a hassle, so it's very handy to have breadboards. I'm sure I've talked about this before, but I have this tiny little breadboard that cost uh, $2.50 at Active Surplus in Toronto. Very handy to have. I've also got one that's uh, slightly wider but much longer. This is the very standard uh, size breadboard. Um, it's got uh, five uh, pins on each side of the center divider and it is 64 uh, rows tall, and it's got a um, power bus on both sides. Very handy, very standard breadboard. Then you can go to double that size with a single voltage bus like this. So now you've got two of these rows on either side to put stuff in, but with just one voltage bus down the middle. And this is the type that's mounted on this plate that has the voltage banana plugs, which is really handy because then you just run cables from there to the voltage bus and you can just plug in banana plugs directly from your power supply or whatever you're using. And then when you're starting to get into really serious stuff, forgive me, this is just gonna take me a second to pull this out. It's actually so big that I haven't been able to keep it on my uh, bench lately because I literally just don't have room for it. Then you can get into the big beasties like this. So this has got a power bus along the top 
two power buses actually for two separate voltages and then you have one, two, three, four, five power buses in between and then you have one, two, three, four separate breadboarding sections. So this is good if you're working on a whole bunch of different circuits or if you uh, have one really big circuit. This is actually the breadboard I was using when I was working on my Z80 single board computer. Alas, that project kind of died. I haven't worked on it in quite a while. I still have a Z80 uh, processor. Um, it's actually sitting on a board over there. Uh, I still have, um, I mean, I've got SRAM. I've got all the stuff you need to create one. I just sort of lost motivation um, because I wasn't really getting anywhere. And I didn't really understand the programming and the setup behind it as well as I should have when I was starting out. Um, I don't want to discourage anybody, but if you are, ugh, man, I hate having boxes that are this unorganized. When you're starting out in electronics, um, it is good to set your sights high, you know, challenge yourself with a good project to keep yourself going, but the problem that I have with that is that I set my sights a, sights a little bit too high. Luckily, it didn't discourage me from continuing, uh, but at the time, it was kind of a bummer because I was working on the Z80 circuit. I was reading so much stuff and breadboarding and changing things and trying to learn, but it was so complex that uh, I just didn't really get anywhere with it. I only ever got the Z80 to do very basic um, blinking. Uh, it was just counting in binary as the program counter incremented. Uh, the cool thing about the Z80 is that you can clock it manually, which means that you can flip a switch back and forth and it'll clock out the actual processor clock. Uh, so you can have it running at like less than one hertz, you know, click, clock, click, 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 or a couple hertz or whatever. Or you can hook it up, of course, to an oscillator have it running at up to 20 megahertz and I actually bought a whole bunch of 20 megahertz oscillators um, not that I ever really needed them for my Z80 because I was never really able to get it working anyway my whole point being that um, microcontrollers actually seem to be a really good spot for me to learn that's why I'm building my frozen board because it's a so simple nice really simple board there's only you know five input output pins six if you include the reset line um, it doesn't have a whole lot of space, uh, but that's why I'm also going to include an AT Tiny 85. I think I've decided that the kit is going to come with both, so that you can start with the AT Tiny 13, and then as the uh, lessons get more complex, you can just pull it out of the socket, whack the AT Tiny 85 in, and then we've got you know a bit more space, uh, a few more features. It, the AT Tiny 85 has hardware serial interfaces built in, which is kind of nice. Um, of course, we can still implement. Uh, serial interfaces on the AT Tiny 13, but you just have to do it in software, um, which is kind of cool. That actually might end up being a lesson if you're ever programming a microcontroller that doesn't have the serial, um, the serial protocol that you need, and you're at the p stage in the project where you can't just switch your microcontroller. It's really good to know how to implement these sort of things in software. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling on. Um, my whole point was to. Uh, you know, have realistic expectations of yourself. You're not gonna learn everything in a day, but at the same time, it's important to balance that with challenging yourself. Um, it's really easy to get bored with electronics if you're doing things that are really simple. Um, the important thing is every time you sit down at the bench to work on something, make sure that at some point you're saying, wow, this is so cool, or like, uh, what I'm doing is really amazing or wow look it actually works like even though my oscillator here isn't actually working properly when I turned and looked at the uh, oscilloscope and saw that it was actually generating a frequency that's really cool you know it's encouraging because then it makes me want to keep working on it it makes me want to um, keep tweaking things figure out what's going on and learn how to build the circuit properly um, that's why having an oscilloscope can be so handy. I also have a crappy, well not crappy, I mean it's a it's a half decent oscilloscope. I think it's just 48 megahertz or something, one of these Handtech USB ones. The reason that they're so important for beginners, uh, that's why it's nice just to get a cheap one or a USB one or whatever, because being able to see what's happening can really motivate you, because you can see, oh cool, even though you know my LED's not blinking or it doesn't look like it's working properly. Ah, you know, it is working properly, but it's just going way too fast for me to see it or whatever the case may be. Um, so having an oscilloscope, being able to see what uh, is happening can be really key to motivating yourself to keep working on the project. Um, 
in this case, if I were to hook up an LED to this or something to try and see if it was working, I wouldn't, it would just be solid on. I would have no idea. Or in this case, actually, because the duty cycle is so low, it might just be off. Um, so the only way I'm able to tell that this uh, circuit is working is because I have my oscilloscope hooked up. Um, so of course that's huge um, for things like this. Anyway, I really hope you guys are uh, enjoying the videos I've made. I recently got these digital potentiometers from Analog Devices. I also made this cool little breakout board for any dip package. I mean, you can do the same thing with the breadboard, uh, but it's kind of nice just to have a, this is a 28 pin socket, I think, and this is obviously a thin dip, uh, but it's nice to just be able to whack something in there without having to do a whole breadboard and then just add power or whatever, and uh, whack a couple probes on there and just sort of fool around. Also good for the bus pirate so you don't have to have the whole um, breadboard beside it and get kind of tangled and messy. That way you can just have the nice tiny little bus pirate and this little thing and you can be prototyping with uh, whatever. Now the curse of the digital potentiometer seems to have struck again. I have a digital pot from Microchip. For those of you that don't know, a potentiometer uh, like one of these, it's just a variable resistor. Um, and the reason that there's three contacts is because uh, between the middle one and the outside ones, those are both resistance values. And by tweaking them, they move uh, inversely. So if you have it turned all the way to one side, and let's say this is a 10K pot, you'll have 10K on one side, and then well, as close to zero as you can get on the other. If you have it halfway, both of them will be 5k. Um, if you don't know what pots are, you should definitely do a little more reading. They're very basic. But having a digital one is a really cool thing because then you can control them with a microcontroller during a program. Instead of having the user have to actually turn the knob on the potentiometer, you can send serial commands and have the resistance value change digitally. Now, I have one from Microchip. I played around with it with the bus pirate with microcontrollers and for some reason I was just not able to get it to work. Yes, I could get it to turn on. Uh, when it turns on it automatically goes to mid scale, so halfway between whatever its value is. In that case it was a 10k pot. So you turn it on and you would see the resistance go bang to about 5k. I would send it all sorts of serial commands, couldn't get it to change. So I ordered some of the analog devices ones. This is the AD5206. It's actually got six individual potentiometers in here. Very simple serial interface. There's a chip select, a clock, and a serial data inline. That's it. There's no data that comes back out. You just feed data into this. And it doesn't work. I don't know what's going on. All you have to do, it's a very seri simple serial command three bits for the address of which potentiometer you want to change, and then eight bits for the value. You do that, you clock it in while chip select is active, and it's supposed to change, but it doesn't. So that's been frustrating. I've been trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, I have a few different things on the go. I'm going to keep you guys updated. The frozen board uh, documentation is coming along well. I'm going to need beta testers at some point. Um, so if anyone's interested in testing them, um, you might, I might have to charge a little bit. I might be able to give the betas away for free. We'll have to see. But let me know down in the comments if you're interested. Anyway, this video is almost 20 minutes, which is kind of hard to believe. Hopefully this wasn't as boring as some of my other videos. And I didn't yawn a single time. What a miracle! <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye.